Well, a pleasant good morning to you on this Friday. We're glad you're here. If you could find your table, we're going to get started with the program because we value your time. We want to make sure you're ready to go and you get everything you need to know before you start your day. Welcome to the 23rd annual Emerald Youth Prayer and Fundraising Breakfast, the key 23rd annual. That in itself is an achievement. The crowd sounded, choir is ready to go. They're going to be back here in just a little bit, and you've got some special notes for you here in just a second. I'm Matt Hinkin from WATE TV. I'm on the Board of Advisors, and pleasure to be here with you this morning on behalf of the Emerald Youth Foundation Board of Advisors and Trustees and our Chair Doug Kennedy. Thank you for getting up early with us. I got a question for you. Was anybody up with me at 2.30 this morning watching the Nashville Predators win in triple overtime? A couple of you were? I couldn't shut the TV off. I got home at 12, first overtime, and then the second overtime, and then the third overtime, and I was like, come on. But the Predators won. So if I fall asleep halfway through the program, wake me up, okay? Now, this event is totally supported by people like you, and we appreciate table hosts being here. We appreciate our sponsors, including the Graham Corporation, Tenova Healthcare, and Home Federal Bank. We also appreciate the hospitality of the Knoxville Expo Center and all occasion catering for breakfast. And of course, we are grateful to so many of you who have taken your time to be table hosts. Your hard work is appreciated. And please join me with thanking all the sponsors and all the table hosts for being here this morning. Thank you. Now, since launching the breakfast more than two decades ago, Steve Diggs and his staff have strived to make it a meaningful time of prayer and worship, and that's our desire this morning. The event was actually the first way I became involved in Emerald Youth Foundation many, many years ago, 23 years ago, and they haven't kicked me out of to be an MC yet, so hopefully that will continue. God's answered a lot of prayers for the foundation, and God has answered a lot of prayers in my personal life as well. Speaking of prayer, um, prayer to me is one of the most important things that I do each and every day. And I'll be honest with you, prayer has become sometimes hard, sometimes easy. Sometimes we get our prayers answered the way we want them, but most of the time we get our prayers answered the way God wants them. And, you know, prayer for these children in this day and age is multi, multi, mucho importante, we should say. It's amazing what happens through the power of prayer. Um, you know, when we read the Bible every day, if we're, we're challenged to read the Bible every day, and if we do, it fills us up spiritually so we can live the Word of God in our daily lives. Our physical body needs food just like you're getting now. Our spiritual body needs prayer and the Word of God to keep going. And that's why I claim the promises of God each and every day. In different ways, I'm amazed at the way He presents Himself here to my life, in my walk with Him, and the work I do at WATE and with the Emerald Youth Foundation. Claim his promises like he promises never to leave us or forsake us. Can anybody agree with that? Yeah? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means he doesn't change. Amen on that. And you know what? In Joshua 1.5 it says, Just as I was with Moses, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will not fail. And when God says he will not fail, guess what? He will not fail. You don't need Twitter to reach God, although you can reach him through Twitter. I've seen many posts on Twitter, but you don't need to tweet God to get his attention, do you? No. You don't need to Facebook him, do you? One day we'll see him face to face. You can FaceTime him on your hands and knees, but to Facebook him? Nah, he's already there already. What about Instagram? Psh, he, he was Instagram years ago. I mean, he was Instagram... All it takes is a moment and an instant. Our lives will be changed, the Bible tells us. And you know what? Snapchat? Pfft, he's already there. So we don't need Snapchat to reach him. All we need to do is call upon the name of the Lord and what? He will be saved, right? My daily routine is to take care of my family and take care of my, my personal belongings and take care of my personal needs. And then I go into work. And for most of you, you know what my job is. Is there anybody that doesn't know what my job is? Don't raise your hand, okay? <laughs> but my job is to forecast the weather. And what is that? That's a step of faith, right? When I get on TV each and every night and I tell you about the weather forecast, I have faith that it's going to come true, right? <laughs> I know what you're going to say. 
You're the only person I know who gets paid to be wrong 50% of the time, right? No, but see, I always have an alibi. God creates the weather. I've never claimed to create it or control it, and I know he controls it, but it is a step of faith. I'm reminded years ago of a young boy who was, in a, who was out in the country, a country church, and it hadn't rained in days, and it hadn't rained, and it was dusty, and the preacher said, okay, we're going to come to our, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to meet at the church, and we're going to have a prayer for rain. So they got at 2 o'clock, and the congregation gathered at the church, and they were praying outside for rain, and they were kept on praying and praying, and about 15 minutes later, the pastor looked up, and here comes this little boy, and the little boy had something in his hand, and the pastor looked at him, and the little boy walked up to this prayer rally, and this prayer rally for rain, and he was the only one that brought an umbrella. Now, how's that for faith? Faith is everything. And we have faith that God's taking care of these children. You're going to hear some wonderful stories about these kids. But the power of prayer and the faith that we have in the leadership of this foundation and their community that these kids are in, we just ask that you prayerfully consider what God would have you do today. Because this, this is an event that's going to be really, really special. And I know from the 23 years of emceeing this that it's an event that uh, could change your life. Not, in, not only your life, but the lives of these children as well. So as we continue in our call to worship, we're going to remember that prayer and praise and worship is what it's all about. Your stomachs are full, you're awake, you're ready to go, it's a Friday, we've got a good weekend ahead of us, and as we continue to worship, I'd like to ask two fine young men from Emerald Youth Foundation to come out, and Tori O'Neill and Tyshawn Young, who will lead us in our opening scripture and our opening invocation. Let's pray. Then you will call upon me and come pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Please bow your heads and join me for our invocation. Father God, thank you for bringing us together for a time of worship. We are humbled by your goodness towards us and praise you for your work in our lives. Draw us closer to you through your word and the stories and music we'll hear today. Lord, I also pray that you will be with all of us young people in the city. Protect, guide, and lead us as we leave here later today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's give a round of applause to Mr. Cedric Jackson, longtime Emerald Youth Foundation staff member. Cedric. Good morning. My name is Cedric Jackson, and on behalf of the staff of the Emerald Youth Foundation, I want to welcome you. Over two, over a thousand of us here this morning, the largest crowd ever gathered for the Emerald Youth prayer, and fundraising breakfast. For some of you, this may be your first introduction to Emerald Youth, and we say welcome. For others, you've been coming to the breakfast for as long as it has existed, and we're grateful to God for your continued support of our ministry. No matter your journey here today, I trust and believe that we have all gathered out of a genuine concern for our city's young people and their future. Emerald Youth, a 25-year-old faith-based nonprofit, has been a vehicle that provides the people of God the opportunity to bring hope and restoration into an otherwise bleak story. Our mission is to raise up godly young adult leaders who will grow in their faith, begin to serve others, and one day reinvest in their city's neighborhoods. We work every day toward this outcome through a variety of initiatives in faith, learning, and health. Those of us who work in our ministry know that every day in the city isn't a mountaintop experience. Some days turn into long nights 
when youth and their families find themselves in crisis, as we've seen over the last several months. But the thread that is woven into the fabric of the work that this group of believers is called to is prayer. With a very strategic and prayerful posture, we've come to understand that the work that we do is on God's agenda. We look not to our own strength, but to a voice that reminds us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Several years ago, a group of believers had a dream. They pointed to a verse in Zechariah which says that the streets of the city would be filled with boys and girls playing. And they prayed that one day this might be a reality for Knoxville. They went as far as to pray for a soccer field that could be used by children in the city. This was our prayer, a prayer that we felt that God was placing on our hearts. There were some who said, you're thinking too big. And we said, let us tell you about our God. Sometime after that, God answered that prayer when the Sansom family reached out to us and began a conversation about the possibility of a sports complex in the heart of our city. This past year, we cut the ribbon on that new facility. And over 1,000 kids, boys and girls, were playing on those fields in the very first week. A couple of years ago, <laughs> thank you. A couple of years ago, we felt God's hand positioning Emerald Youth to bring Knoxville its first charter school. Once again, called to chart a course that some would call impossible. And once again, we took a very prayerful posture that we might discern God's will and God's course of action through intentional and fervent prayer. At the end of this month, scholars at Emerald Academy will have completed their first year of school. With applications for next year nearly doubled, we've already received five applications for every seat. What a wonderful God we serve. <laughs> These are but two of the hundreds of examples in which God is faithfully blessing a ministry through prayer. Sometimes the Lord answers our prayers with something as big as a sports complex or a new school, projects that contribute to our ability to reach over 2,000 kids every year. But far more often, we pray for that one kid in that one neighborhood, that they might come to know the gospel in a more full way walking in humility, loving in God's mercy, being just, and showing leadership in their community. It is this slow, constant, daily grind of prayer and seeking God's will that is the hallmark of our ministry and the hallmark of ministries of churches across this city. As believers, in a mission field, tackling work we know to be too much in our own strength. We look to God's wisdom, God's will, and God's way. Now, let's hear from a couple of prayer warriors who are in this work with us in a work that we dedicate to God's agenda. Thank you.
One of the earliest biblical examples of prayer is found in Exodus chapter 5, and it's a great scene where Moses is praying to God, and he's asking God about the troubles that the people that he is trying to release from Egypt are experiencing. Prayer is powerful and really does so together the fabric of the church. When we pray, sometimes we're praying for things in our own lives to happen for us, but it also brings us together. When we're praying, it's not because we're telling God things He doesn't already know about us. He created us and He knows our hearts better than we know them. What we're doing is bowing before the Lord in humility and saying, I'm completely dependent on you. Over the years, we've prayed diligently for God to show us specifically where we can work with kids and where we can be an influence in kids' lives. We started at one church, the Emerald Avenue United Methodist Church, and now we've grown to over 15 churches and more than seven communities. The Emerald Youth Foundation has been working with young people in their communities now for over two decades. Just a few years ago, we never would have thought that we would have had the opportunity that we now enjoy because of the Sansom Sports Complex that we have in downtown Knoxville. Every single day, we've got kids on that field playing and running, and it gives us the the, the understanding that God has truly blessed us through our prayers to see that kind of opportunity come to fruition. We think it's important for young people to see themselves as servant leaders in order that they might know that God is calling them into a time of restoration for the communities that we serve here in Knoxville. We need our communities to flourish. We want our children to see themselves as catalysts for change and lead in charge to restore our communities. At Emerald Youth Foundation, it's always been our mission to incorporate prayer into our daily practice with children. The kids are praying and they're desperate to find the right words. They're desperate for God to see their hearts. They're desperate to be seen and heard by adults that care about them. I pray for my granny because she just got diagnosed with diabetes. I pray for my mom's ankle to get better. I pray for God can like help others and stop making bad people do bad things. I think it's important for us to pray for our community, for the children, for our churches, because it's something that brings us together. We're asking God to be a part of these families and these children's lives but we're also asking God to do something in us too. And not only is God going to do something for our communities, but God's gonna do something for us. I pray for strength. I pray for courage. I pray for healing. I pray for my neighborhood. I pray for you. I read a quote the other day that said, if God answered all of your prayers, would the world be changed? Prevet, and I had the privilege of serving on Emerald Youth staff for almost 14 years before I retired in 2012. I got to know Ballard Hall and his family right there in the Emerald Avenue neighborhood. Ballard participated primarily in our Wednesday night program and in basketball. And let me tell you, that kid was a competitor. One of the ways that I've always described him is that he was a tough kid, but I mean that in a good way. If I've ever known anyone that was born to be a Marine, it was Ballard Hall, and you know what I mean. Ballard has been tenacious his entire life. I have been blessed to stay in touch with him. 
and it has warmed my heart to see how he has allowed God to lead him as a veteran, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a husband, a father, and a brother. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to my friend and brother in Christ, Ballard Hall. Thank you, Nita, for that uh, really awesome introduction. You punched me right in the feels on that one, so thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ballard Hall, and I am an Emerald Kid. Uh, growing up, our, our family had to move around a lot. In fact, I went to a different school every year uh, through grade school, and it wasn't until high school that I finally uh, settled down in one place um, and went to Fulton High School. Many of you know where that's at. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, however, uh, one of the brief moments I went to Little Springs Middle School, uh, one of my teachers introduced me to a staff member uh, with Emerald Youth because she thought I needed extra help uh, academically in some subjects. Um, she haggled me enough that I uh, finally decided to go and see what Emerald Youth was all about. Um, and as you can imagine, I was a little apprehensive because as a young seventh grader, I didn't feel I needed any help academically. Um, Shortly after that, though, it turned into a really fun time for me going to the Emerald program, uh, which at that point in time was at the uh, Virginia Street over in the Western Heights community. Uh, went over there, a gentleman by the name of Vernon led that program, and it turned into fun stuff like going bowling, uh, having snacks with friends that you wouldn't see elsewhere other than in that program, uh, playing games, board games, you know, these types of things that uh, at least at that time for me, wasn't going on anywhere else, uh, not the home, not, not school or any place like that. It was only at Emerald where I felt that there was that sense of camaraderie and relief, if you will. Uh, one day while I was at Emerald, uh, over here off the Central Avenue location, I met Nita. Um, and she quickly, you know, took to me, like she said, and I quickly took to her. Uh, she realized that I, being the oldest in my family, had a lot of influence on my siblings, um, but not only on them, but really the way that I influenced them, other kids took to that also. And she quickly uh, reminded me the power of my influence and became a really influential person in my life. As a high school student, I was really involved in two things, ROTC um, and playing basketball for Emerald. If it was not one of those two things, I didn't really care for it. As a high school student, uh, it was difficult for me to really care about a lot of other things until Emerald uh, came along and placed value on those things that I otherwise didn't find any value in. And so there's a huge part of my life that is attested just to Emerald um, for that reason. From the time I was nine years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to serve our country and join the military. My grandfather had served our country with honor as a CB in the United States Navy for more than 30 years. And I guess you could say it was in my, it was in my blood. September 11th, 2001, I'm sure we all remember that date. Uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, also in ROTC at Fulton. Uh, you know, I remember what that day felt like um, when our country was attacked. I'm sure everybody does, but for me, I knew right then and there that the military wasn't just some far off dream or a want or some type of desire, it pretty much solidified that. So I enlisted and a few weeks after graduation when the rest of my friends were packing to go to college, I didn't pack anything and went to Paris Island and joined the United States Marine Corps in 2004. In June of 2005, I deployed to the Middle East, served alongside many of my brothers in arms in the United States Marine Corps infantry. I want to say this about my time in the Marine Corps Infantry. It's not a place for children. It is a place of warfare, and you do some pretty gnarly things. But it's also for people who, like me, are from a place where you don't know where your next meal is coming from or whether the electricity will be on that day when you get home from school or if all you had in life, or at least thought all you had in life, was basketball at night in the streets. The infantry is a place of intensity. But serving in the United States Marine Corps gave me a chance to put into practice something I learned as a young person at Emerald, and that is serving others. 
I felt and still feel so passionately about protecting and serving others that I would put my life on the line every single day to do just that. In fact, I did put my life on the line over and over again, and it was then that I really truly gained an understanding of the meaning of Christ's sacrifice for us. Sacrifice became even clearer for me when serving overseas, protecting my brothers in arms. And just so happens, a lot of you can't tell, but I lost that due to that service. And if I had to do it over again, I would lose all of my limbs if it meant that I was protecting my countrymen. After I lost my leg, I was sent back home where I finished an eight-year career in the United States Marine Corps as an intelligence analyst, a security officer, and, and among many other things. By then, I had married my beautiful wife, Mariah. Go ahead and stand up, babe. Let everybody see that face. There she is. Yeah. Uh, we actually got married at Emerald Avenue Methodist Church on Central. Our reception was in the a fellowship hall adjacent to the basketball gym that I have played hundreds and hundreds of games in. Uh, so truly, when I tell you that I am rooted in this program and in this Emerald Avenue community, uh, it literally means entirely rooted. I knew I had a lot of people around who cared about me despite that reentry was tough. As many of you know, reentry into the civilian population for our veterans is becoming more and more difficult, and it's a problem that, you know, Several of us need to figure out. I'm not going to point any fingers, though. Uh, 2014, however, was an incredible diffi incredibly difficult year for me. Uh, when I came back home, meaning here to Knoxville, uh, and a little bit before that, I struggled. I was, used, I was used to quick decisions, risky situations, and I would get frustrated that the general public didn't understand what was happening in my head and how quickly my brain was working. I lost friends, I lost relationships, and I almost lost my marriage. And one day I woke up and thought, something has to change. I need to do something different. I have to. So I decided that I would start my own company. My grandfather, being a CB, had taught me a lot about construction. I have a brother. Uh, Stephen, where are you at? Stand up. Everybody give Stephen a round of applause, please. <laughs> Stephen's a, a structural engineer. And I said, well, you know, our granddad taught us a lot about that field, and you just so happened to work in that field, so let's do this. And together with my brother, also a combat veteran, I might add, uh, we launched Custom Concrete and Design, a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. We do work throughout the entire East Tennessee region, and I know that God has blessed me with the opportunity to own my business with Stephen and be our own bosses in, in a way that allows us to directly impact our community how we see it best fit. My wife and I have two children. Children, stand up. <laughs> There's our children's. My son is Ballard Jr., but he goes by Doogie, uh, like Doogie Hauser. I didn't even know that dude existed. That's just a nickname that happened. Um, and then Miriam is our four-year-old daughter who thinks she's 30. But I, I thank God for them every day, my wife, my kids, my brother, Emerald Youth, everybody. I, I pray uh, for their safety and their courage, their hearts. Uh, this morning is really all about the power of prayer, prayer for our city's young people, prayer for the young men and women who live in some of our city's most vulnerable and poorest neighborhoods. So what does prayer have to do with my story? If not for the prayers of the body of Christ through the people of Emerald, I'm 100% certain that I would have ended up in jail or dead before I graduated high school. And you you hear stories like that. You hear stories of people saying, well, you know, if it wasn't for something, I probably would have went to jail. Those are true stories. There are people like that. Me and my brother happen to be two of them. Um, this foundation done miracles for us. Young people in the city, myself included, often do not have the family structure that is needed to facilitate prayer in our homes, schools, or communities as a whole. Emerald Youth Foundation and the prayer of its people centerlined me. I grew in my faith. I learned what it meant to be a leader. I learned what it meant to be kind to others, even if they don't deserve it. And I learned that you don't always have to retaliate, even if the other guy really deserves it. That's a difficult one. 
Relationships I built through Emerald are not only the sole reason I'm successful today, they are some of the sole reasons I am not dead. And I know for sure this is true because some of my friends and family that I grew up with that was in the same community and went through the same program sometimes, whereas I and Stephen went all the time, didn't make it out like we did. I had enough people in my life through Emerald and in the neighborhood who I knew prayed for me. They prayed that I would be safe walking home after church, prayed that I would be okay playing basketball where I broke my wrist, and play, prayed for me when I served overseas. Those letters and, and memorandums and all kinds of things you get when you're overseas like that. You know, you, you hear folks getting you know, their gift packages and whatnot, and those letters mean something. Uh, whether or not it means something to you that day, eventually those letters mean something. And if any of you ever sent any of our troops those types of letters, I personally thank you. Uh, prayer is a critical, reoccurring theme throughout my life. It means everything to me because prayer is about relationships. Relationships with your friends, your family, relationship with God. I am grateful for the prayers offered on my behalf by the body of Christ through Emerald. I am grateful to God for the opportunity to be standing and walking again and on this stage today. Thank you for the heartfelt prayers you have offered me this morning on behalf of kids like me. I believe that God hears the prayers of his people because I have seen that in my own life. Prayer makes all of the difference. One last thing. If everybody could get out your cell phone, I have a favor. If you could do for me, I'd appreciate it. And go to Facebook if you have that. And when you get there, search Custom Concrete and Design and hit like. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, hearing the children <clears throat> sing every year is an important part of this tradition. It's inspiring and, as I said, very important to us and so thankful that they understand that they are a child of God. This is, uh, you've heard this morning already, our 23rd event. <clears throat> First year, uh, we hosted our breakfast event at St. Mary's, now Tanova Physicians Regional Medical Center. We had less than 100 people in attendance. <laughs> it grew <laughs> and uh, has said this may be our largest crowd ever today, 10 times what it was 23 years ago. But just another example of how much the people in Knoxville care for our children in our city. So whether it's your first time with us today or maybe you were with us 23 years ago and there are some of you in the room who attended that event, I know that you're here this morning. Wherever you are in between that timeline, we're glad you're here. We're grateful that you're here, and we thank you for taking time with us this morning. Along with the choir every year that's important and has to be present, there's something else that, that's a part of this tradition that we want to make sure that every year we, we communicate as clearly as possible with you to not only remind you, but to remind all of us with Emerald Youth and to affirm us, to affirm, for us to affirm together this message. And that is this. If change is going to happen in the lives of our young people and in the neighborhoods, in these distressed neighborhoods in our urban community, then the work the ministry must be undergirded in prayer, for the Lord must be present. We ask that you agree with us every year with that message, every May, and be reminded that we cannot lead God out of this work. I was fortunate to participate a couple weeks ago in a meaningful event a prayer walk in Mechanicsville organized by Pastor James Davis. It was a gathering that was a response to the terrible act of violence against 12-year-old Jawan Latham. If I can, let me just pause and let us just recognize something this morning that I think the body needs to pay attention to. Such a pronounced act as this is a true example that evil is still at work in our city and in our community. In John chapter 10, it's a guiding verse, verse 10 of chapter 10 is a guiding verse for our organization and our ministry. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life. But in that same verse, he says, but there is a thief who comes. And we know what he said. He says, that thief has come to kill, steal, and and what? Destroy. And just too much lately, and in the years past, the enemy has preyed on the hearts and the minds of our innocent children. And there was a comment made by one gentleman at that prayer walk that's ringing clear to me this morning and, a, and, and rallied the crowd, as you can imagine this morning when you hear it. He said this, he says, we have to come together in our community. He said, the hate must stop. The violence needs to stop. There is no need for it. And he went on and said this, these people need Jesus in their hearts. And you'd expect that man was one of the pastors and, and the pastors were obviously uh, affirming such a comment. But this was the comment of a man in our community that I think that we all have grown to appreciate his firm but compassionate leadership. And that's Knoxville's police chief, Chief David Roush. Chief Roush is here with us this morning. He's to my right, and I know that you want to show him your encouragement and your support of him and his leadership in our community. Chief Roush, I know this is a surprise to you, but would you care to just stand and let us recognize you and say thank you.
acts like this was happening too often in our community and even years before obviously cause us to really stop and question why. And that's been on my heart, my mind, and our staff. We've sat around and asked that question often recently. It's also the kind of act that, that causes us to really start seeking what's the institutional solution to such a problem as this in our community. But this morning, we really want to make it about an invitation to individuals, an invitation to inv individuals to respond to this question. And that is, what is my role? to shape, to help shape the hearts and the minds of our children. What is my responsibility as a member of the body, as a member of his church, as a member of this community, what is my responsibility to help protect our children? How can I better invest my life and invest my resources to their life transformation? And I have to say, I share this question with you and this invitation today, believing that I'm in a room with people who really believe, that deeply believe, that every child, no matter what their zip code, deserves the opportunity of that full life Jesus spoke about in John 10, verse 10. I trust this morning that I'm in a room with people who believe that transformation can happen in these young lives and in these urban neighborhoods. Transformation like happened in the life of Ballard and, and transformation that's occurring in the lives of these children here on stage this morning. I know you can see it in their eyes and hear it as they sing. I also hope this. I hope that Emerald Youth Foundation has become a trusted organization for you to choose to steward the resources that God has blessed you with. And so this morning, as the choir sings one more song, we simply want to ask you to respond to the invitation to say, this is how I, or this is how Knoxville, as Dale Keesling points out so often, can care for the least of these in our community. This is how Knoxville will do it. And we ask you to show that today with a financial gift you can make a gift today to this ministry and its work and its mission. You can make that a pledge to be played later, uh, paid later in, uh, this year, or you might consider that pledge monthly. We have credit card options for you this morning, and in the back of your program, there is a small envelope that you can remove to make your pledge, to make your gift to this organization today. And I'll ask after you have finished completing the envelope. If the table host will take the large envelope at the center of the table, collect those, and there'll be a person at the back of the room in which you can turn those in on your way out. And after the choir finishes their song, and after you finish completing the envelopes, we're going to close this morning with a focused prayer time interceding on the behalf of our children in our city. And I know you're going to want to stay to enjoy that moment. We'll finish at our regular time. Thank you, and may God's kingdom come here in this city into the lives of our children.
This morning, this morning as we, we close in this time of focus prayer, I've asked my good friend, Dr. Shelley Page, to come and, and facilitate this prayer time. Shelley is professor of law at the Duncan School of Law, LMU, and uh, she's here today with her husband, James. James is a detective uh, with Knox County Sheriff's Department. But Shelley, would you come up here now and, 
lead us in this time. And thank you so much thank for sharing you. with us today. Thank you. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's you guys. <laughs> The Bible says, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. And so it, a different version says, at every time and in every place, from the moment the sun rises to the moment the sun sets, may the name of the eternal be high in the hearts of his people. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Holy God of the universe, of all that we can see and what we don't see, God of the open air, we come as a body of believers before your throne, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence to be with us as we seek your face, your will, and your way. We ask you, God, to please forgive us for our sins, our transgressions, our mistakes, our errors, our flippant words and attitudes that we display towards one another and to you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, and make us new. Make us in your son's image and likeness so that you will be seen, creating us a new heart and renew a right spirit within us. If there is anything in us right now, God, that hinders our prayer from being heard, take it away from us, God. Heal us, clean us, fix us. Minister to us and hear our prayer, please, Lord. Lord, where we falter, help us. Where we fall, where we fail, pick us up and give us your victory. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Lord, we come to you this morning filled with frustration, anxiety, hurt, and pain. Our current situation reminds us of the scripture that says we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. So we come with hope, with faith, with anticipation and vigor, seeking your face on behalf of the youth of this city, this state, our country, and even our globe, for we are all in desperate need of you as our Savior. Your word says that the devil walks around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. But God, your word also says greater is he that's within us than he that is in the world. So we come this morning seeking your power, seeking your anointing, seeking a vision and a clarity of mind and purpose, seeking your will, your way in our children's lives. We declare that the spirit that you are pouring out on the youth of Knoxville is stronger than any rebellion, any insurrection that the enemy can concoct. We declare that you will arise and contend against the enemy, and you will save our children. We declare on behalf of our children freedom from rebellion, dishonesty, disrespect, freedom from drugs, freedom from sexual addictions, freedom from gangs, drugs, freedom from the bonds of slavery, even a mental slavery that has the power to overtake the mind, freedom from the snares and traps of this world. We declare that you will, through our leaders and teachers and parents and guardians, allow us to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Allow our lives to be pure and holy so that the examples that we set for our children will be godly ones. We pray that the things that they see in us will teach them your ways and the fear of the Lord. We ask humbly, God, that you will make your presence felt among our, our youth so that this generation will know the love of God in such a way that will break through religious and racial barriers, reject territoriality, spiritual pride, selfish ambition, so that the unity Jesus taught and believes in will be made manifest. We pray that the young people in our community will not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. We seek and we claim in Jesus' name that the young people will help to usher in a move across our community whereby your name will be praised. We ask God that your holy word be honored, loved, and obeyed in the youth of our community. 
God, we cry for a recovery of the absolutes of your word in our land. Your word says, Lord Jesus, oh, ancient of days, that you created our inmost being, that you knit us together in our mother's womb. You said, God, that you know the plans that you have for us, for our children, and those are plans to prosper us and our kids, plans to give us and our children a hope and a future. We know, God, that you have a vision for every child. Your word says that you have ordered our steps and you know our destiny. So we declare that the youth of our community and nation will fulfill the destiny and the curse of affliction, poverty, hopelessness, violence, gang warfare, teen pregnancy, children born out of wedlock, sexual violence, immorality, and godlessness will be broken and abolished in Jesus' name. Lord, you said that at your name, demons must flee. So we say to Satan, you have no power over the lives of our children. You have no authority over our kids. You have no control over our futures. So we rebuke you and command you to go back to the depths of hell from whence you've come in Jesus' name. We pray that our kids will wrestle with you in the midst of the darkness and will not give up or give in until they see your face and you bless them. We ask God that you will seek, that you will seek us daily and that we will seek your affection and that we will be reborn with the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the true knowledge of who you are. We declare that the young people of the Babylon of today will take a stand for truth and holiness and will not compromise. We are claiming in Jesus' name that our children will receive a double portion destiny and that they will rise up and be the mighty men and women of God that you have ordained each of them to be. We ask God that you will have us and our children turn our eyes upon Jesus to look full in his wonderful face so that the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We declare that those burdened and overshadowed by a spirit of death and destruction, but desperately wanting a true life, will find it in your love. Bring forth an anointing and breathe new life into the souls of the youth of this city, our nation, and our globe. Redeem what the enemy has stolen. Do it, Lord for your holy name's sake. And when all is said and done, when time shall be no more, when the last trump shall sound, we ask God that we, us and our babies, will be in that number that no man can number. And we will hear you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, as you prepare a place for each of us, God, in your kingdom where we will spend eternity worshiping you, Lord. Save us for your kingdom, and we will be careful to give you all of the praise, all of the glory, all of the honor for you and you alone are worthy. We look forward, God, to that glorious day when we will stand on the sea of glass and cast our crowns at your feet and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Until that day, Lord, we need your mercy. We need your favor. We need your love. We need your grace, your amazing grace. And I'm going to ask, guys, if we can all sing the first stanza of Amazing Grace. I recognize my gifts. Singing is not one of them. So pray for me as we sing the first stanza of amazing grace. And can I ask, I know it might be kind of awkward, can we all stand and hold hands with the people that are sitting at your table? God bless you. Thank you.
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amazing grace. Thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. May the same power that rose Jesus from the dead go with you from here today. God's name. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.